Göttingen.
Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Got some barking dogs. Hold on, I think I'm getting a feedback loop. Hey, everybody. There we go. How's everybody doing? Got some barking dogs. Hold on, I think I'm getting a feedback loop. Hey, everybody. There we go. That should have solved that. Hey, everybody, how you doing? We've got a couple of people in here. Great. Hi, Kitty. Hi, Roger. Clean Cut Media. How you doing, guys? Jacob, hey, 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 how you doing? We got a few people popping in here. This is great. This is great. We're just going to hang out a couple more seconds, get some more people in here, and uh, well, let me uh, let me hide a couple of windows here. There we go. You guys, I, I guess, can hear me okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Somebody say yes. Oh, no problem. Great. Okay, thanks. Great. Awesome. All right, all right, all right. Cool, cool, cool. There's a slight delay, but that's okay. So, I've been putting up a couple of videos about vocals and um, doing some stuff. I'm wondering if you guys uh, have any questions. Anything I can help you with studio-wise? Yeah, there's a delay, no problem. We can deal with the delay. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just fill that in. Um, anybody have any questions on stuff uh, that I put up, or any questions you need to make your music better? Any questions about the music business? Anything I can help anybody with? Uh, I just want this to be real informal, and you know, everybody could just not have. No fear of putting up something silly or stupid. It's all good questions. A little bit of a delay, but we're good. Also, let's take a little little poll. Um, out of you guys, are you guys making music or are you guys just, just listeners of music? This way you could figure out how to, um, you know, Touch music since the 90s, wow. Oh yeah, Jacob, we gotta talk about vinyl, definitely. Just let me know if you guys are musicians or you're actually making music on your computers and or, or in studios or you're just kind of, you know, really avid listeners. And Jacob, let's talk about uh, growing vinyl. Run a youth music project. Oh, wow, that's really, really cool. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, hey, Katie, do you make music? All right, let's let, let, let let's talk about um, started DJing eighty two. Great. All right, cool. Electro, because I discovered this gender in Europe. Yeah, yeah, great, great. All right, cool. All right, cool. Um, let's talk about vinyl just a little bit because Jacob had asked me before. So vinyl is a really big deal right now, right? So if you're making music, if I'm stopping like this, I'm reading what you guys are saying. 88 to 92, okay, great, great, all right. Um, Vinyl is a really big deal right now, right? But if you're selling records as an artist, it's really not a lot. So vinyl is important because there's a lot of vinyl junkies and a lot of really good people that do music, um, uh, that appreciate music and, and, and collect vinyl because you have a physical record in your hand. Um, but vinyl doesn't sell a lot, right? Vinyl probably sells a thousand to five thousand copies. If you do digital downloads, you could sell hundreds of thousands or millions of copies. 
when you press vinyl, it costs a lot of money. So a lot of people ask me, hey, why don't you, are you going to put your songs out on vinyl? Well, you know, you have to do something called master a record, which is different than mastering, which we're going to talk about in the studio sessions that I'm doing. They take your record and they take it from the audio, whether you're doing a, usually a digital file, and they cut a master record. And out of that master record, they make a, let's put it, say it's a positive record. They make a negative plate out of it, out of steel, and then that plate is made for pressing the vinyl. They heat up the vinyl really, really hot, uh, hot and it comes down and it stamps it, right? And that's the, uh, and then out comes your record, and uh, on that becomes a label. That the mastering process is several hundred dollars, about three to five hundred dollars. That are places that do it online, and then once you get that, you have to then pay a company to uh, um, to uh, uh, put a label on there. And then you have to go to a printer and print out the jacket. Then sometimes the printer will wrap it in shrink wrap. Sometimes you don't have it wrapped in shrink wrap. Uh, if you have artwork, you have to pay an artist. If you don't do your so by, by the time you get finished with it, you can spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on putting out your record. Now, there are places that will do that for you now, right? So there's one-stop shops where you go in and you say, hey, I just finished a track. Here's my record. Cost you, you know, uh, I don't know what the price of vinyl is because I don't follow it, but a couple of dollars of vinyl and then you could sell it. But then you have to ship it or they ship it and they charge you. So by the time you get through with all this stuff, there's not much profit on it. And if you don't sell records, they're going to ship it back to you and you're going to be eating vinyl for breakfast because you're going to have boxes and boxes of vinyl. So vinyl is really great and it's great for vinyl junkies and collectors and all that stuff. But a lot of people, smaller artists, can't afford it. There are some places that'll actually do vinyl on demand now because they know a lot of these small comp uh, small artists don't have the money to put five grand down on pressing a whole bunch of records and then you have to physically ship them around the world. So if you're an American shipping them to Europe, you gotta pay shipping fees, import fees, taxes. I mean, it gets really, really crazy, right? That's why you had record companies in the, in, in, in the, in the past because they would take on all those um, you ever take on all those expenses. So um, vinyl is great. Um, it has a different sound to it. Personally, I can't afford to do it, right? But there are places to do on demand, and once you reach 50 or 100 vinyls, uh, you send people to this web uh, website, they take orders, and once it reaches 50 or 100 people, then they'll go ahead and print a stack of 50 or 100, and they'll mail them out to your customers and charge them and stuff like that. So, uh, Jacob, I, heard, I hope that's kind of, I mean, uh, um, Roger, I hope that's uh, helping you understand, you know, my thoughts on vinyl. I think it's great, but it doesn't, there's, you know, you sell 5,000 vinyls, that's considered really, really good. I mean, in my day, I sold 5 million vinyls, <laughs> you know. So, uh, it's expensive if you can afford it, and if you're a musician, you want to do it to, you know, so all the cool DJs and stuff, but um, yeah, it, most of vinyl uh, uh, demand is coming from kids buying the stuff. Sony recently set up a record pressing plant. Yeah, because it's really important, you know, it's it, it's relevant, it, but we live in a digital world, you know, everybody puts their stuff on their, you know, on their iPhone and listens with earbuds, you know, so is there ever going to be a major demand? Do you own a record uh, player? Uh, I don't, and I've been in the business 45 years. I haven't had a record player for 20 some odd years. The moment CDs, DAT tapes, and um, all that kind of stuff came out, I kind of stopped using my record player. But it's really cool, you know, really cool. So that's kind of my thoughts on vinyl. Um, Rogers, you said you have a Studio One as your DAW and uh, an MK3. That's pretty cool. All right, um, so the stuff that I'm showing you guys can either be used in Logic or GarageBand or Ableton Live or Studio One or, or, or uh, Steinberg or whatever you're doing. So uh, how would your mix sound change for CD and vinyl streaming? Really, 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 really good question. That's a really, really good question. When you're doing digital mixes, you basically have the whole sound spectrum to... Uh, 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 you know, at, at, at your fingertips. When you do vinyl, you actually have to mix your audio 
differently. Um, so I learned this because a lot of artists don't go to the mastering sessions. Some guy somewhere masters your, your, your vinyl. But I was lucky. I used to go to my mastering sessions, uh, uh, thank God, because I learned a lot. And we used to use Herbie Powers at, oh, I can't remember the name in New York. Uh, I can't remember the name, but we'd sit on a couch and he'd be back there and he'd have some equipment and there's this big record player. I mean, the disc was like that big. And uh, he'd put this piece of acetate uh, and it's acetate, um, it's almost like linoleum, but it's acetate and you could scratch it really easy. And they had a special grinding needle that would uh, be very precise. And he'd put the needle down and it would make your record in reverse. And it was so cool because as the record's spinning, you would actually see the grooves get wider and wider, right? And if there was a break in the record, he'd hit a button and then it would make a break. So if you look at vinyl, there would be a little space between uh, the thing where you can, uh, it was, uh, it was, was it Master Disc? Was it Europa Disc? No, Europa Disc was downtown. I can't remember. Thanks, DJ Spidey. I can't remember. If you look up Herbie Powers, um, was it Master Disc? I can't remember. Anyway, um, I've got one eye here and one eye in the chat room trying to keep you guys together. Um, not Bernie Powers, it was uh, Herbie, Herbie Powers. We used to call them Herbie Pump Powers. Um, so when you mix for, oh, okay, typo. Uh, if you mix for vinyl, he showed me that, um, you know, you, you, you have only a little channel where your, your waveform is, and he inspects it with a microscope, and he let me look, and you actually see, like, waves in between the channel. If you put in too much low end, right, those, waves get really, really wide and push against the channel. So when the needle goes through there, if you put too much bass in, it'll actually jump over to the next track. So part of his job in mastering and part of your job in making his job better, so he doesn't have to use compression or he doesn't have to bring the volumes down, is don't put too much low end. Now what's low end for vinyl? I'd say maybe something under 70 or 50 cycles. You kind of want to do a hard cut in that if you're mastering for vinyl. The same thing with a high end. If you don't want too much high end, it's really, really brittle. And a lot of the needles, when they vibrate and pick up the sound, can't get it. Or if you do, you run the record through two or three times, those are very fine little, little, little imprints, you know, on, on your vinyl. And that'll crackle away really, really fast and your record will sound dull a little bit quicker. So when you do master for vinyl, it ha it's usually at a slightly lower level, a slightly more compressed level, and your dynamic range, your lows and your highs, are a little bit, a little bit sh um, more confined. Um, they can get around it. See, the whole thing with vinyl is you have those squiggly lines that the needle is reading on vinyl, right? So how do you? Um, he can adjust that 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 trough, that that you know that track. He can make it wider. But since that's a spiral, you would have less time on your record. So if you want that really, really deep, deep bass, then maybe you'll get seven or ten minutes on a 45 instead of whatever it is, 12 or, 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 or 15 or, uh, or 20 minutes, you know, uh, on, a, on, a, on a record. That's why records, 12-inch singles were better because they spun at a higher rate and they had wider channels and you got better bass. Um, when you had an album, you had to bring it down, uh, 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 the speed down, and you had finer grooves, but you couldn't have that really great dynamic range. Uh, I'm reading, let's see, uh, use, uh, FL Studio, great. Uh, used to make electronic music, trouble is the mastering, my friends say. I need to pay an engineer to resolve it, but I don't have enough money. But you don't have to pay an engineer. Consider this passion not to make money, or use a tag, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you can do your own mastering, but in a previous video that I just did, you have to, if you're going to master your stuff, first of all, obviously you have to learn about mastering. I will teach you and other people online will teach you. You have to take your head and not be that person that writes the music anymore. 
You that can't be the person that's mixing your records. You have to throw that away and pretend you've never heard your track before and go ahead and master. There are several products that you can use for mastering. I will open up Logic right now. Give me a second. Um, where are we? Let's see if this will work. Give me a moment here. I'm going to try to get Logic open. Uh, and I'll show you what mastering stuff looks like. This is going to take a second for, for Logic to open. And a lot, uh, Logic, uh, I, don't, I don't know FL Studio, but there's a, a, a couple of places. Yeah, bad EQing is, is a problem. You cannot master or mix the same day that you are mixing. You can't master a mixed day the same day that you're composing, is what I meant to say. Do not sit in the studio for eight hours or six hours and then go ahead and mix the same day. You will wind up with shit, and God knows I do. Okay? Your ears, uh, from the previous uploads, your ears fatigue, right? And if you don't have a good monitoring system, you don't have to go out and buy expensive stuff. But um, hold on, let me just open up an empty project here in Logic. Now, like I said, all this stuff will be just as compatible with uh, Logic as FL Studio or anything else. I'm going to go grab a drum loop real quick. Take a second to load up the, uh, the loops. All right, let's go to um, drums. Or where are my drums? Let's go to beats. Where's beats? Sound of eggs, brass, strings. Uh, a percussion since. I just want to get something so I can show you how to master. Where are the beats? There they are. They're right above sound effects. Okay. Let's grab anything right now. These are built-in drum loops. You don't get any more basic than that. All right. Let's take that. Let's drag it in to Logic, and I'll show you a mastering real fast. So say your song was just... Come on. Aren't you going to come in? We want you. Uh, good old logic. They just updated it and it's acting so weird. There we go. I had it running. So I'm going to have a four bar loop. This is logic's mixer. I'm going to make this really, really simple for you guys. Most, um, most software has plugins. Okay. So this is where we get the plugins in Logic, right over here. And for mastering, I can use their mastering uh, stuff. Let's see, in Dynamics, it would be a multipressor. And this comes up. It's a plugin on the master output track. So you have a master output track somewhere. All your tracks of audio will get mixed down to this one track. And here's your mastering. You know, you, you usually have a place where you could plug in this master track with a bunch of um, plugins, right? And this, this is a multi, multi uh, 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 compressor. So right over here, final hip hop compressor, final pop compressor, final rock compressor. You can use that as a starting point for mastering. And now when this masters, I don't know if you could see, but down in the very right hand corner, there's two columns. There's, uh, uh, it's got purple underneath it. You see over here, it's red, it's 1.5. That means it's too hot. You want your levels to always be at zero or slightly below zero. I'm going to play this audio track and you're going to look and I'm going to reset this. Okay. I don't know what you guys could see because of the resolution, but right now that red is telling me 2.0. This is so, so important. That means it's 2 dB above zero. Now there's two ways you can change this. You can either go into your mastering and over here, you can't see, I don't know how well you guys see, this is output over here, this is the out. 
and over here it says minus 3.6. So minus 3 plus minus 2 is minus 5. Let's take this down to minus 5.6. I'm going to take it down to 6.0, a little more. Now, well, I, we're at 5.6. This should now, I'm going to reset this. This should now keep it at zero. And look at that, the red went away. Can you see that over on the left-hand corner over here? The second column over, it's no longer red. You may not be able to see the detail on this with the broadcast. But I went from this blowing up the output to now keeping that, keeping that, happening. So mastering has two functions. One of that is to stop the level from getting so hot that it distorts people's headphones. The other day I did a broadcast and this is brand new recording software and the recording software said uh, I, I mean I had the, the microphone too hot and it was crackling in somebody's ears. That's because it went past zero. When you deal with digital, zero is the absolute you can't go hotter than zero. If you do, it starts to distort. In analog, you can go past zero. It just starts to come. There's the circuitry should compress it, but when you go past zero in digital, it distorts. So you want to keep everything at absolute zero. And by putting this compressor on there, it's putting a cap and it's saying you can't go any further than this level. So most of your faders should have a little output read. Again, you guys can't see this, but I'm looking at the drums on the very left column. It says minus three, and that's about the hottest that it's getting. If I bring this up to zero, all of a sudden, you see what happened? Our compressor, our compressor is not keeping that level there because I increased this by two dB two decibels. Now that little red mark over here now says 2.6. I'm 2.6 dB over. So 5 over here, uh, we're at 5.6, so 2, 5, 6, 7, so minus 7.6. Let's make it 8, right? 5, 6, 7, 8. Let's hit it again. Let's clear the red down here on the lower left-hand corner. And look at that. We're not distorting anymore. Oh, we are. There's a couple of peaks that just went in there at 02. You could probably get away with that. There are other little devices. I'm going to show you the ones that are built into Logic, and then I'm going to show you the ones that I use, which are external plugins. So I have the compressor. Then there's some places call it a brick wall compressor. Some places call it an adaptive limiter or, an, or a limiter. What a limiter will do is it will not let anything get louder than your output where you want it. Hey, grilled cheese. Look at this. I get grilled cheese delivered. Yes. Homemade grilled cheese. I'm going to hang on to that for a second or two. Um, that's Billy. Billy's visiting, making grilled cheese. Thanks, Billy. So on the output of, um, of this, we want to make sure that no matter what, it never goes past zero and you can use a brick wall compressor you can use a limiter they're kind of almost the same thing hey you got us what's up Billy all right so in this case uh, in this case let's use this limiter to stop the levels from going past zero so you're going to get the loudest sound Oh uh, yes, a limiter is better than a compressor in certain... Well, a compressor is variable and a limiter is a brick wall, right? So if you bring your volume down, you can have compression that gives a little bit of dynamics, but that limiter is just going to put a brick wall over, over it and nothing will go past... Yes, you, 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 you can throw a brick wall on your master, yes. But if... It, like again, I don't know what you guys can see on the left here, but there are two, two plugins. I have my compressor happening first. The chain goes from the top to the bottom. So I have my compressor, and then second, I have the limiter. So the compressor is trying to keep stuff from not going too crazy, and then the limiter is really creating a brick wall. All right. 
So, to create that brick wall, let me reset this red thing over here to zero. Okay. What are the best settings for compression? That just depends on what you're doing and what your source material is. Sometimes you want to set a compressor really high so you get that pumping thing like in a lot of trance and you know club music with that wah, 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 everything is pumping so you set them high. Usually for vocals and stuff uh, I set it around uh, um, uh, a ratio of uh, 2 to 1, 4 to 1 and then you use the threshold to start to watch that meter or that VU come in and you just kind of keep it nice and hot, but always use your ears. Because sometimes when you bring up compression, you're going to bring up background noise. So if somebody was singing with an air conditioner on in the room, or a fan, or there's traffic outside, remember when you're bringing, a compressor will keep the top down, but it'll also bring the bottom quiet stuff up and kind of make it even. You may be bringing up the whole noise threshold. Some rooms have an echoey, you know, sound in it. And if you bring up compression, you're going to bring up all that stuff too. So you have to listen with your ears. To, to, uh, if you're doing a, a, a drum and it's hitting really hard, maybe, you know, eight or 10, uh, a 10 to one ratio, play with the comparison. You, you know what, with a lot of this stuff, here's what I tell you to do. Just, just throw in some drum beats, take a mix that you have, and spend a couple of hours on compressor, and you're gonna start listening. Uh, and you have to listen really, really carefully. So that gets back to your, uh, what I said in the, in the previous video about having a constant monitoring system. If you, I use these headphones, these are Sony MDRs. I love them. I happen to use the, uh, the Apogee plug-in and I, it gives me really high quality sound. You don't have to use that. You could plug your headphones into, um, into the side of your laptop and do it like that. But if you're gonna do that, then use that same system for listening to MP3s, for watching movies, all that kind of stuff, because you need a solid point of reference. Once you know what other people's music sounds like on your speakers, on your, on your headphones, don't use computer speakers. I mean, technically you could, but there's not a lot of dynamic range. Even if you use cheap Apple or, 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 or um, Samsung head, uh, earbuds, fine, but just listen to everything on that. So now you're gonna know whether you have high frequencies or low frequencies, whether your music sounds like everybody else's, including mastering and compression. Once you have the same system and you mix something, I tell you, listen to it in your car, listen to it on your Walkman, put it on your TV, listen to it on your multimedia. You're gonna get an idea of what it sounds like, right? If it only sounds good in your headphones and like crap every place else where you listen to other music, then you're gonna learn that your headphones are too bass heavy or too treble heavy and you can start adjusting for that. Let's get back to um, this, uh, uh, the, the brick wall limiter over here. So what you can do, Again, let me see if I can make this interface even bigger. Ah, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Logic, how about that? There we go. So, if you can see over here, the third knob over says output level, right? And this output level is set at zero dB, which means it's gonna keep everything in that fader over here on the lower left-hand side at zero dB. But I like to take it down either I usually take it down 1 dB, minus 1 dB. This way, if something sneaks through, you're always, ne uh, if there's a quick transient, it may be, there are peaks that happen in, in audio, and sometimes the trend, they call it transient, because your music's here and boop, little, little spikes come out. Uh, um, uh, this will stop those, the, that little transient. Sometimes the software, the way they program these with algorithms, are made for general music and it can't catch really super fast peaks, I take it down 1 dB over here and that'll stop a peak from happening. So now if we look at that again, I'm actually at minus, minus one, one, there we go, minus one down here on the left hand side. Watch, watch what happens when I make this really loud. If you can see on the left side, if you can see on the left side, it's red plus six. But look, on the right side down here, we're talking about all the way on the, over, uh, on the left hand side of your screen, it's now lit up nice and bright 6.0. You can't see that, but it's red. But our output is still at minus zero. I mean, uh, uh, minus one. And that, this brick wall limiter is coming in and doing the work. How to read this limiter? 
this first knob that says gain, if we're working on a really quiet piece of music or the stuff is really loud and you can't get any quieter, you could change this gain knob. You hear the volume getting softer and quite the other way. Look how, look how hard I'm slamming it. And like I said, I, I don't know if you can see the master output, but on the master output, it's still at minus one. But did you notice how the sound changed? This is what you talk about doing a lot of compression. Listen to the drums. I'm going to make it soft, and then when I bring it loud, it's also going to bring up the space and the reverb in the drums. Watch the sound change. That pumping is the, um, this, this limiter working and bringing up not only the loud stuff, putting a cap on it, bringing up the soft stuff. I usually leave the gain at zero. Sometimes I have to go in there and tweak it a little bit. Don't worry about release times yet. Um, look ahead, just leave it whatever it's set at. But your output level, I always make it at minus one dB. And these meters on the input side, this is showing what's coming in. And there's no reduction right now, right? If I bring the gain up, you're gonna watch the reduction. It's showing you 0 0.6, 0 0.3. It's, it's almost at, at, at zero. The output is, is minus one. The reduction is the amount of limiting that's going on. Watch the center get high, hotter. The yellow is showing me that it's over zero. The amount of reduction, it's, if, if you look the numbers, say input, 13, it's 13 dB over zero. The second column is, it's reducing your audio by 13 dB to come out to minus one. All right, if I bring this down to eight, We go and I think you can click on these to clear them yeah you can click on them and it'll clear them <laughs> if you click on them it'll update them some update automatically some you have to click on so a brick wall is a really great way in mastering to stop levels from getting hard, hot, too hot now there's a whole other side of mastering and that is adding EQ and frequency and stuff to make your mix sound better because you screwed up and you put too much bass in it, you didn't put enough treble, you didn't listen to what I said, and when you uh, uh, mixed it, your ears were fatigued. So when you go back the next day and you listen to your track, oh my God, I just did the world's greatest mix, but you know, there's no high end in it. Mastering can fix that, but you really gotta be careful. So let's add in, I got a, a, in between the limiter and the, uh, a, a, in between the compressor and the limiter, I'm going to put in some EQ. Uh, let's go to EQ. Now there's regular EQ and something called linear phase EQ. What linear phase EQ is, when you're pressing vinyl, your left and your right have to be in sync. If they're out of phase, like the needle, the left channel and the right channel have to move the same to get your sound. All right, let's do it a little bigger. If you're out of phase, they're working like this, and it can create, um, it, it, it'll weaken your bass, it'll phase a vocal, uh, something that's in stereo will suddenly become mono, something that's in mono, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't be out of phase in mono. You can be out of phase only in stereo, but it'll mess it up. Um, linear, if you're, if you're, uh, um, your, your DAW, your workstation, has linear phase EQ. It's great to use on mixing because it, it actually makes sure that everything's in phase. Something you really don't have to worry about, but it's a great thing if you, can, if you have it. So I'm going to now put the linear EQ, i got to move it up here, between, after the compressor and before the brick wall. So we have compressor, EQ now, and the brick wall. All right? Let me shut down the brick wall over here. Let me open up the linear EQ. Okay, now, if you don't know how to read an equalizer, the le these are numbers. 
20, 50, 100, 200, these are bands of frequency, right? On the left side, the lower the number, the lower the frequency. 5K, 2K, K means 1,000. So we're going from 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles. The lower the number, the lower the frequency, the higher the number, the higher the frequency. So let's take this drum and shape it a little bit. And remember, our brick wall is there, should protect us from overloading it. I want to put a little more hi-hat in this. I'm, I want to bring out the clap. And I'm going to put a little low end in here. I'm going to take, I'm going to take this off and then put it on. This is before. And this is after. I hope you guys are listening with earbuds and headphones because these are subtle differences, but these could be major differences. And with this tool, you can shape the final output of your mix. But you better make sure you have your point of reference because if you're listening to earbuds that don't have high end, right, and that high end is dull, you're suddenly adding this high end or it doesn't have the bass that you think you want and you're putting it in there and then when you play it on another system, you're gonna go, oh my God, the bass is so boomy, I can't hear the rest of the music. So first and foremost, you need a point of reference Always mix on the same speakers, the same earbuds, the same headphones. You don't have to buy a fancy interface. I bought this. This is $250. It's the uh, Apogee. It sits into a USB port. It gives me a little output where I can plug in a guitar or some sort of a mono keyboard and a microphone. It also has a microphone built into it so I can actually sing to this and use it as a microphone. But I like it because the resolution is really clear and that goes to my headphones. I actually have it going through a little preamp to my headphones because I like to listen a little bit louder than I should. We'll, we'll do a whole thing about hearing. All right, so I'll show you what I use and Kitty and uh, Clean Cut, I'll get to your stuff in one second. I'm going to take this stuff off and I use a different company's plugins. This is the stuff that came with Logic. And these are, well, it may be a little bit better, but you got to pay for it. I go with the company. By the way, guys, these are all plugins that I have. And each one of these open up to, you know, uh, 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 each one of these are synth synthesizers or, or EQs. Why do I have so many? Because some of these are. Uh, are made uh, as emulations of old school gear and some of them you just want that sound you want you know uh, something to sound like 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 my old record well you can go into some of these uh, uh, old school plugins and and, and deal with it uh, uh, you, you'll get that sound so I, I use Slate Digital Stephen Slate has a company and he's taken all this old school studio gear and he's they put it through a supercomputer, analyze how it works, and they make algorithms, and then they become a plugin. So when you have a Prophet 5 synthesizer or a Minimoog synthesizer as a plugin, and I'll show you what that looks like right here. So let's go to our tour. Uh, let's go to. Uh, where are we going? Um, Arturia, right? No, not Arturia. Uh, Native Instruments. So let me, wait a minute, oh, because I'm in plugins, I'm sorry. Let me make a track real quickly. That's why you're not, we're not seeing it. I'll show you what a, what a, what a old school synthesizer plugin looks like. Let's go to instrument. And there, there we go, whoops. All right, so let's go to a Jupiter. This is a, a Jupiter 8 was a big deal, right? So this looks exactly uh, uh, this looks exactly like a Jupiter, right? This is an old school. Cool, right? So how did they get this to sound like a Jupiter? They took the circuitry, they put it in a supercomputer, 
they analyze the circuit boards and they make a plug-in all right so this you can have all the old school gear all the new stuff it's all done this way it's, the new stuff is written as code the old stuff the circuit boards can be actually translated into computer code and they come up with this let me get rid of this track so we don't confuse you guys so for mastering I use Stephen Slate he went and he did the same thing with a bunch of old school gear and where are we uh, slate digital all right so here's a really cool thing that I put in ahead of my mastering this is a virtual tape recorder all right let that sink in for a second this is a virtual tape recorder because a lot of digital stuff sounds very brittle but like the like the the vinyl question how do I get my stuff to sound like vinyl without actually turning it into vinyl right well this I'm gonna hit play <coughs> now you notice how loud everything got guys because I took the compressor and I took the brick wall off let me bring the volumes down for a second there we go see the little VU meters you see the tape spinning that's actually softening the sound and making it more analog. You have a digital sound, you have a full frequency bandwidth from low to high. Old school, we didn't have that bandwidth. This kind of smooths the edges. And uh, good question, what, what digital audio works to work? What computer program do you use to write music? You should type it in the chat room, that'd be great. This takes the edge off of things and makes it a little bit more analog. So I usually throw that in. Next, I go to the same company, Slate Digital, for fourteen dollars a month, you can get hundreds of plug not hundreds. You can get like twenty or thirty plugins if you go to slatedigital.com, or is it Slate? Yes, I think just put in Slate Digital and Google, and it'll, and it'll get you there. And then I use this great piece of stuff, which I love the sound of. Now, a lot of this is very subtle sound. This is a little mastering rack. On the top is our compressor, like I showed you the last time, and on the bottom is our brick wall but this brick wall has a little sweetening in it and I'll show you in a second I usually leave it slightly at the default settings but what this will allow me to do is pump up the volume which will be this lower thing here I try not to keep it in the red you'll get the perception of a louder mix like as if you turned up the volume without hitting into red it has a brick wall in it so I can start adding so if my audio normally sounded like this if you put in some gain you can actually bring up the volume of what you're doing but if you look down on the right side right left side we haven't gone to zero yet so this is a great way to add volume and if you want compression, the dynamics were just lost. There we go, the dynamics are back. This is a way between these two things to also do mastering. And there are, isn't there? Yeah, there's presets in here somewhere. Ah, oh, here we go. He's got some, some presets over here, which you can use. This, are you talking about the Jupiter plugin or are you talking about this plugin that I'm using right now? This plugin is from Stephen Slate, Slate Digital. For $14 a month, you have to have a little uh, USB um, dongle because it, it's copy protected. But Stephen Slate has all these mastering tools that you can get for $14 a month. And this is the, um, uh, what's it called? FGX. Final, I don't know, it's some sort of a final mixing thing, right? Yeah, sound is loud and clear, but that's what this will do. This will give you plenty of volume. Why are we not getting it? I just muted, that's why I muted this. Say if this is what your mix sounds like, you can go into Slate Digital and bring it up to that. What a difference in volume, right, from this that but we're not going over zero and that's what 
mastering will help you do. It'll bring up the volume and put that brick wall on it so you could your mix will sound louder and better. There's a whole thing about loudness wars, people trying to make their music sound louder than everybody else's. But since everybody does it, and if your mix sounds like this, and everybody else's mix sounds like this, they're just gonna sound better. All right, so mastering does this. How do you master? Look in your digital audio and see if they have limiters. The limiter wants to be the last thing before your mixer output. On Logic, I can put this stuff in on the mastering channel. Most of your, uh, your, your, your digital audio workstations will have a place to put plugins on the master channel. Some work from the top down. There's a signal flow. It's going to go into the mastering and then flow down to the mixer. Some are going to work from the bottom up. You'll be able to figure that out. I would. One thing I sometimes put in too is here. I'm just going to throw this in for a second. I go into uh, um, utility and gain, right? And I put this before the tape machine. Let me just move this up here. Okay, what gain does is it's taking everything in the that's coming in before this. We're talking about the master channel now. We're talking about mastering, right? Everything that comes into the master channel, if it's too loud. This is kind of like a like a, like like a volume knob before it gets into my my uh, my my mastering output, right? So it's just kind of another way where I can I have a little extra control. Oh man, my mix is so great! I can't take everything right now and 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 pull it down. Well, if you put gain in there, you have a volume knob at the top of that mastering, and then you can go ahead and work everything over here. When you if if, if Yes, please mix one day and then, I mean, do your song one day and please mix another day. If you have to mix it the same day, do four or five or six hours. Let your ears rest. If you walk out of a, um, if you walk out of a, uh, um, a concert and your ears are ringing, your ears are fatigued, right? And you're not going to hear it properly. Our human voice is most sensitive around 800 cycles to about three or four thousand cycles. That's where the human voice is. And you will start losing hearing range. Let's put it that way. All right, guys, that's a little, we'll, we'll do a whole thing on mastering, but that's, anybody could do mastering, but it's also an art form, okay? So you can't just open up a mastering thing and master. Although, I'll show you, there is a company that has a all-in-one, but the problem with the all-in-one is they're mastering, not you. And once you learn how to master, you should be able to, here, we go to Isotope and uh, uh, RX, uh, not Ozone. I got a lot of plugins, right? Uh, God, I haven't used this for so long. Isotope Ozone 7. What this does, and it's gonna be as confusing as hell, is this is a whole mastering suite Whatever you're using, you have to learn. There are very few plug and play things. There are some plug and plays where you turn one knob and it gives you better stereo and it gives you better uh, uh, reverb and all that kind of stuff. But if you really want to do mixes and really have a sound, you just learn this stuff. You buy it and you spend a couple of nights, a couple of days just fucking around with it until you get, get it what you want, right? So this has presets. First one says all purpose mastering. Here, brighten your overall mix, how to master for CDs, crisp highs, how to make the, uh, the mid-range better, increase the high end, increase the low end, make it punchy, how, how to polished vibe. These are all their settings. So you can go into this stuff and you can choose one of these and then put a brick wall underneath it and you're set. I like a little bit more control over my, my stuff. You can also go into this and create your own. You don't need theirs. You click on this. And here's the tape recorder I had in the other thing. I just take the vintage tape recorder, I put it in here, and you have to understand what all this means. I can't, I don't, I don't think I could stretch this any bigger, can I? No. You have to learn this, right? But you can basically use the plugins. If you're feeding it not a crazy amount of level, your mix, before you get to mastering, when you mix, 
Let me put that. Let me put the mixer up again. Let's see if I can make a couple of uh, tracks. Let's do something here. I'm going to give you a couple of tracks here. I'm going to show you a couple of tricks. Let's make eight tracks. Oops, nope, did that wrong. Let's do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's just copy the same thing over and over again. And this way you can see it on the mixer. We're just taking that drum track. It's going to sound crazy loud. Okay, now we have those eight tracks of audio here. Right? We have eight times what's going on. Okay? So let me go put a brick wall on this so I don't kill you got your, your ears. I'm going to show you what gain does for me. I'm going to show you uh, the, the, the virtual tape machine. It's just something I love to use because it just makes it a little bit more old school in my particular case. And I'm going to put the slate limiter on here. Okay. Let's ignore those for a second. Listen to all this. But if you notice down on the left hand side or on my master fader, it's not going above zero even though it's distorting. Say this is your mix. There's two ways to bring this down. You can select all of your tracks. Most digital audio uh, station, uh, workstations will let you do this. And you don't want to grab your master. You want to grab all your tracks and bring all of it down at once. Watch. I'm moving all the faders at once, right? Now my whole mix is a lot lower. If it's still not right, I can always go into gain over here and bring it lower with that. Remember, that's on our master output. Let's bring this up to zero, because in a perfect world, we want everything to be at zero. You could grab two or three tracks. Say these are vocals. You could just bring these up and leave the others behind by selecting multiples. Make sure you deselect it before you select the next one. This is only a single track going up and down. Say we have a mix and it looks like this. Right? This is our mix. Everything's too loud. Grab all of your tracks. And you can bring this down all as once. You see they're all moving in ratio. That's a great way to just bring the volume down a little bit while you're mixing and then push that vocal up a little bit louder and nothing's in the red. All right, let's go back to a couple of questions. Uh, people using MPC and Logic, that's great. The Jupiter is from, uh, um, uh, the Jupiter is from Arturia? God, I got so much of this stuff. Let me go back and take a look. Let's delete a couple of tracks in here. Let's do plus. We're going to put in an instrument track in Logic. I think it's Arturia has the... Uh... Yeah, these are Arturia. They have an ARP 2600, which I actually still have in my storage thing. A Buchla. This is the Fairlight. This was a $100,000 synthesizer. Art of noise, right? That's what they used to use. We used to rent these things for 100,000 bucks. You could rent it for $100 on a Friday. They were closed Saturday and Sunday and return it on a Monday. We used to do a lot of stuff. Uh, Alicia's too turned on. We did a lot of records with this. Frankie Goes to Hollywood was done with this. Art of noise was, uh, it was done with this. Grace Jones pulled to the bumper. Anything Trevor Horn did, Michael Jackson uses for Thriller that, uh, you know, that sound. This was one of the first samplers. We'll get into all this stuff later. But all this stuff is virtual. Artoria has a, you can buy all this stuff as a set, and it's a couple hundred dollars, it's a little expensive, but you can buy, uh, 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 you know, like a, like a pack of stuff for several hundred dollars. Let's get to the next question. How about a show where people send in MP3s to give advice on the track? Okay, this is something that I was really thinking of doing for you guys. Instead of MP3s, you can send me your audio files so I'll show you how to do that and I can take it and I'm not gonna remix it for you but I could take what you have and clean it up so if you have a mix and you're having trouble with vocals or you just want to see how I produce it, uh, 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 approach it and get it back to you I don't want to take an mp3 and analyze it because maybe you're not monitoring properly so I can't say your mix sucks because there's too much high end or low end that could be simply because you don't have um, you know, 
the right kind of monitors, you're not listening properly. But what I may, I was thinking of doing, and you could do it through, um, through uh, 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 what's it called? Um, we transfer is you send me your audio files, and there's a way on all these computers to mix these out. Here's my thing, my drum track, and you, you could export as an audio file. I'm, I don't know what kind of detail you guys can say, but most of these workstations will let you export each individual track as an audio file. And if your audio, if your thing is, you know, 50 bars long, you just go track to track, export as an audio file, export as an audio file, export as an audio file until you get all that. You send Dropbox, we transfer, all that kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. You send me it, and then um, I could then take it and throw it up on Logic and work with you guys and show you how I would approach some of this stuff. I want to keep doing these live sessions like this with actual working files so you can see what it's actually like to mix and record and master after watching me. You go to your digital audio station, you try to recreate it, or if people are cool, I mean, I don't want to take copyrighted stuff, but if people are cool, maybe everybody in the class can get it and either follow along or they're watching me and then they can open up your song on their digital audio workstation and try to get the same result using their stuff. I want to make this work for you guys, you know what I mean? And that's one way to do it. We're cool. You know, if you don't want to share your music around, I totally understand. Or if you just want to come up with something and have me work on it and then spit it back out again, I'll show you how to do that. All right? I think that's a great way to go. I mean, I wish... Uh, when I went to school for a synthesizer, it wasn't like that. I, by the way, I learned synthesis not as uh, on old school synthesizers where you plug in the cables. We had to learn waveforms. I had to learn sine waves and square waves and sawtooth waves and all that kind of stuff. And I had to learn how to, uh, what, what's, what wave, let me put this over here, uh, what wave makes a, um, uh, a violin, what ma wave makes an oboe, you know, how, uh, how do you do a drum sound using noise and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I never used online mastering service like Lander. I would assume that they're good because if they're offering their services. So I have to look into that. I master myself, so I don't usually have to use an online service. I would think they would be good. Do they have some sort of a money back or a partial money back guarantee if you don't like it? And are they mastering for all digital audio? iTunes supposedly has something where you mastering for iTunes. It's supposed to be a little bit more special, have a little bit better dynamic range. I don't use it because by the time you put on a shitty pair of earbuds, it's not that it's going to make a difference. It may make a little bit of difference, but I just do one general master. I use cdbaby.com, which I think is the first thing that I put up, shows you how to do that. And I get my stuff out there, they send it to 100 digital outlets and no one's ever complained and said, oh, your stuff sounds like crap. Um, yeah, a lot of people do learn the hard way, but I learned the hard way too, for a lot of it. So I only learned synthesis. As far as recording, I didn't learn that way. I had to, um, I had to sit there and watch an engineer do it and then they took a break or, you know, the engineer wasn't around for some reason, I'd run, I'd, you know, turn some knobs and, ooh, that's terrible, or, oh, that sounds great. So I had to learn the hard way, too. Um, so if Lander is great, try, you know, I don't know what they charge, but send a mix out and see what it's like. If you like it and you're happy with the results, great. But do you want to pay every time you put up a song? You have to pay $35 or so to get a song up through, uh, um, uh, 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 through CD Baby to send it 100 outlets, what does Lander charge? 50 bucks, 100 bucks? So you're, you're in it for $150 on a song that may turn back and give you $12 worth of profit, right? So of course everybody wants their record sounding the best, but if you master yourself, you're cutting out a paid step, right? So I'm, they're probably good. It's just, do you want to spend the money on it? Or maybe spend the money now until you learn the mastering process. All right, guys. We're an hour in. I would love to answer any more questions, and if not, um, what's what is the tape machine? The one that I just used, the tape machine. Well, it's part of a plugin. Let me see if I could find it here. Give me a second. It's 
you could buy it as an individual, but I wouldn't. I'm on another page here. I'm going into Slate Digital. Let me pull this over to you guys. Slate Digital right here. So they have these virtual technology. Here's what I buy. SlateDigital.com everything bundle for $14 a month. Oh, wait, you guys aren't seeing it. Here we go again. I gotta learn, I'm learning my new software. Uh, where are we? Is it this one? Yeah, I think it's this one. Okay, great. No, it's not that one. It's this one. Okay, this is Slate Digital. This is their website, right? Let me, let me, let me make this, let me go ahead and quit logic for a second, make this all less confusing. No, I don't want to save, but thank you for asking. Let's go into here. I want to make this page a little bit smaller so you can see this whole thing. All right. This is the Slate website, right? So they call it an all access pass for $14. Look at all these plugins. You see all this stuff? All this are plugins that you get when you, when, when, when you get Slate Digital. So let's go to the an all access pass. $14 annual. If you want it for one month, it's $24. So say you're mixing a record. You've done your record. You've done your album. And all you want to do is mix down that album. And you figure it's going to take you a month. You pay $24 month to month. And you get all this crap. You could pay ahead of time at $179 or you could pay $14 a month that's billed every month. Uh, let's see. So this is uh, the virtual recording studio. No, everything bundle. Here's our plugins. Look at what you get. Look at all this stuff. Every one of these things are, here's the virtual tape machine that I had up before, right? All, this is a, um, uh, uh, a, a, an amp. Revival, this green thing over here on the second to bottom thing, that brings in low end and high end sweetening. Uh, air and earth modules, that brings in that low whoom, whoom, through the subwoofers and clubs and brings in the crisps. This thing is called virtual console. What this does is it makes you sound like you recorded your audio through a SSL, which is a famous console or an MCI console, or one of these uh, famous consoles, this emulates the circuitry of that console. And when you pass your drums and your loop stuff, it sounds like you went into a big recording studio and recorded on one of those consoles. These are all to get sounds. None of this is, you have to do this to sound perfect, right? This is only ways to get sounds. Like this, I use Verb Suite Classics. What this is, it takes classic reverbs and they've mo these are all modeled plugins. It takes these classic reverbs like uh, Lexicon 440s and stuff like that that were used in, 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 in big studios and it gives you an emulation. Right over here it says FG 480. It's actually a Lexicon 480, right? So yeah, this is really great. It's fucking amazing. So uh, uh, these are compressors. This is a blue series of compressors. Uh, this is a particular compressor. I don't know which one this is emulating. Uh, Reve. You, 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 there's ways you could find. They can't use the names. They're not stealing the technology. But if they said this is a, um, you know, a, uh, 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 oh, what's that company? Uh, not BBE. They can't use the names of the companies because they'd have to pay them royalties. So this is a way of getting out around it by giving it these uh, uh, crazy names. Here, virtual preamp collection. What this does is you can put this at the top of your plugin on every track. This make you sound like your vintage analog preamps. And you see most classic microphone preamplifier. So it, it, go, go to Slate Digital and take a look at this stuff. It's $14 a month. I'm not, I don't get paid for them. I particularly like it because it's really great if I can't get the control out of Logic. I don't use Ableton that much. But if I really want some fine tuning stuff, look, at this is, the, the, these are um, EQs and compressors. The, the one in the center is from an, uh, from an SSL board. Right, 
Uh, I can't remember what the one on the complete right side is. Uh, uh, an MCI, not an MCI. Uh, I can't remember my boards. It's so long ago. But this is the actual circuitry and the compressors from them. Here's a trimmer. What that trimmer is is the gain thing that I used before. All right. These are compressors. Great for vocals. This thing is called Stress. It's a highly coveted analog compressor. There's, there's inputs and outputs like I showed you before and ratios and all that kind of stuff. Just like your other compressors, it's just, you know, different interfaces. Here you go. This is an EQ. Exact tone of the industry's most coveted discrete EQ. And all these have um, videos you could play. And he'll show you. the Slate Digital FGA Vintage American Equalizer. A faithful recreation of one of the audio industry's most famous and classic EQs. And it's pretty clear why this EQ is so highly. Is that the op amp coloration. So, so he should. FGA, we can crank the high end. Up. So what he does is he shows you examples on what all these things do. All right, guys. So I love it. I pay $14 a month. And I have that on top of all the millions of other ones. But I wind up going back to here because these are pretty, I don't want to say industry standard, but if you're an old school guy like me and you listen to like, you know, a bunch of old albums and records like I did, I've been in the business almost 45 years. And boy, do I look fabulous, right? Uh, I've been doing this uh, for 45 years, and it's kind of like sounds like records out of, out, of, out of recording studios, so I can get that really polished sound out of this. This is a de -esser. What that is, if there's too much, yeah, Neve, there you go, yep, a Neve console. Uh, if, if there's too much S's, this will go in and take the S's out without destroying the high end on your EQ. Uh, here, here's one, you not only get reverb, but you get uh, digital delay lines. Uh, and this emulates classic tape lines, uh, 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 all kinds of stuff. You, you, your, your digital audio workstation has, has, has delay, but if you want to sound like some of the old school stuff. Now, you don't have to have be doing old school music. If you're doing techno, you know, hardcore, you know, trap and stuff like that, you know, deep progressive future house, this stuff will just make it sound a little better and sweeter and nicer than the guy next to you. You know, the, the next record on either side of you that's doing out of your bedroom, your shit's going to sound pretty cool. Go listen to some of my stuff. I'm on iTunes, Spotify, if you have any of the streaming services, put on some headphones. I'm really into having spatial mixes and stuff is here and there, stuff's moving around your head, stuff is here, stuff is away. A lot of the stuff is helping me with that. All right, guys. Uh, thank you, DJ Spidey. I, uh, you know... I did this for a long time and nobody was around to help me. So I'm just hoping that, you know, maybe I can help you guys out. Uh, maybe I can help you guys out and, uh, you know, make your lear learning curve a little smaller so you can get to doing some music a lot big, uh, better. Any last questions? I got to figure out if we should do send me your music. I got to figure out how to do that and, um, you know, uh, uh, how, we, how we can get that happening. Uh, Somebody send me your stuff and I'll and I'll mix it up and uh, and send it back to you. I'll destroy your music for you. You don't have to destroy your music. I'll do it for you. Any last questions, folks? You guys have been great. All right, I'm gonna put on my little theme song, the theme song that I made just for this. All right, I, I, which I used. Um, wait, I'm gonna go back a second. Somebody had a problem with. Um, uh, Loop Cloud doesn't seem to like Loop Cloud though. It, it's a logic is great to use. I uh, use PC Re Reaper. Uh, is okay. Um, I'll answer you. Clean cut. Give me one second. Um, is somebody's PC not working with Loop Cloud because I use it in Logic, right? No, I didn't. I, clean cut. I didn't hit you up yet. I'm going to do that next. But I'm just going back through the chat room to make sure everybody's questions are answered. Um, somebody said they're having problems with Loop Cloud. Um, Loop Cloud should be running on all of your computers through most of your digital audio workstations. If it isn't, 
Um, there may be an FAQ uh, there, or you can probably send them a note saying it's not working on my computer, and they maybe can tell you why, because maybe you have something plug in, or you have something running in the background that's screwing it up. Let me get back to Clean Cup Media. How about a show? No, no, wait. Uh, let me scroll down. Apart from studio space, is there much different sound between uh, uh, the synth versus a VST? Well, um, no, but the biggest problem is if you're using a real synth, like I got, you know, this Arturium uh, uh, Matrix Brood here, I have to take this and plug it in through an audio input to Logic in my particular case, right? This is, uh, you can't see it, let's see if I can, see if I can make this work here. Mm. I don't know if I have enough. So these are like some analog toys that I have and all that kind of stuff, right? This is a, this is a, this is a, uh, a step sequencer. It's 808 style programming. I don't use it that much. I have a Digitone and a Digitact. And this is a little uh, LXR um, custom drum machine. This is a Lifeforms analog synthesizer. That's that. Over on this side, I have, um, that's my keyboard. I have two modals, they're very expensive. I don't use them as much as I really should. I barely use them. And a Dave Smith Prophet 12. So what's the difference between that and the, you know, the virtual plugins? Well, the biggest screw up you can do is they, yeah, my grilled cheese is cold. I know, I'll have to nuke it, which will change it. But cold grilled cheese is, I love cold pizza. It's just as good. Um, when you're taking a virtual, in, I mean, a, a real life instrument like this compared to a VST, they both sound identical. That's the whole deal of it. But when I plug in the analog, I have to make sure I get my levels right. Uh, sometimes I have to compress it to make it sound good. These things are prone to noise because if you have a hum in your system, because your electric isn't good, uh, it's not grounded properly, uh, there's just noise, and these are circuits, and circuits have noise. The digital versions don't have it. So there is no difference between a synthesizer and a plug-in. They try to get it 99.99% .99 accurate. You're not gonna hear that tiny little difference, right? But um, there is no difference, it's just that you have to, you have to, you have to plug this in, and because there's a signal path there, and it's not digital, it, you, you could be adding, uh, uh, you know, stuff. Well, you have to warm up digital analog gear. People tell me, oh, you lived with virtual, uh, you know, analog synthesizers. I used to have one of those walls of Moog synthesizers. That's great, but after it warms up, all of a sudden the oscillators shift. You know, and if you're doing totally analog, you can, yeah, you, you can't save that great bass sound. You come back the next day and you make the dials exactly the same way. They're not the same because the circuits are analog and they've changed. They've warmed up. They've expanded. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, the 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 plugins do sound identical if it's a good company. You can have some crap company that sort of makes a half-ass plugin and calls it a you know a mini Moog or an 808. But if it's a real good company like Arturia, it's going to sound identical. All right. Uh, do you hear Moby selling off his classic drum machine? Sorry. I know Moby's collection. I've seen it many times. You want to see a real big synthesizer collection? Vince Clark from Erasure. Go on YouTube. He bought a building and down in the basement, it looks like a, uh, a store. I have like a, a ton of shit like that, but that's all in a storage thing elsewhere, climate control storage. I, I, you know, I could do a really impressive thing when you guys are here and I'll have walls of synthesizers that look pretty. I don't use it, you know, and it's just going to collect dust, which they have. So I have them wrapped up and all put away. Um, let's see, but we'll be selling off his drum machines. Yeah, because they're all, you know, they're all uh, as, as plugins. I'm thinking of selling my modals at $2,500 each, but they, I mean, they sound incredible but I don't have a digital output. So do I want to stop and plug it in and get the levels and that sound is a little too hot and I got to go back and record it. I wish Modal made a plug in. I would use it every day. Uh, the Prophet 12, the same thing with that. You know, I have an OBXA, which is a great analog synthesizer, but there's also a plug in. I use the plug in, right? 
I bought this because it had a sequencer in it. It looks great. I've never turned it on. How do you get in touch with me offline? Um, you can go to uh, Facebook, Facebook Man Parish Artist, right? And just private message me. I check that more than I check my email, all right? So Facebook, I, I think you can leave comments here, but they're public, but if you want private message, uh, manparish, uh, manparish.com. Actually, you could send me a, 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 an email through there. It sends it through another uh, email that then forwards it to, to my private email address. Or Man Parish Artist, and sometimes I get overwhelmed and it'll take me a couple of days to go back through. I'll have 150 messages, so I'll have to go through them, but that's how you do it. Uh, thoughts on Eurorex. Eurorex are great. I mean, that life forms thing that I showed you over here is a Eurorex. They're great. They sound great. If you got fat fingers, I'm, I'm, I'm 6'4". I got fat, big hands. You know what I mean? Sometimes getting those little Eurorex things between the buttons are hard for me, but they're great. You know, uh, I, I, it's better than a wall of synthesizer that costs you ten thousand dollars, right? So Eurorex are great. All right, guys. I think we got stuff covered. I'm going to try to do this every Sunday. Um, and I would love to maybe get some uh, uh, tracks from some people and uh, I'm only going to do one a week so we got to figure out how to do this so I don't get 50 tracks at once and hurt everybody's feelings that I didn't choose it. A lottery system or something <laughs> where I could just put somebody's music up and show you how I'm doing it. Alright you guys I hope you're getting something out of this and uh, yeah yeah thank you guys. Here's my little song. Take care, guys.